project, which is focused on how the continent can optimize its creative industries, knowledge economy, and harness its soft power effectively to propel itself forward while championing the inclusion of African voices and the voices of the global Black diaspora in global discourse. Today, we're thrilled to partner with African Women on Board to bring you the Black Female Advantage, Agency, Solidarity, and Social Change, where we are examining the journey of Black feminism and its evolution in the face of changing global realities, the linkages to creative power, and the perspectives that different generations of African women have brought to their different journeys. Joining us today are three phenomenal thought leaders, Ucho Fodeli, Lucy Quist, and Carol Abade. The conversation will be led by the formidable Susan Chapman Hughes, who is named as one of the 100 most creative people in business by Fast Company and recognized as one of the most influential women in payments by Payment Source. Before I hand over to Susan, I'd like to say a quick thank you to our amazing audience for being here today and supporting this event. And of course, a big thank you to our media and strategic partners for supporting as well. Over to you, Susan. Thank you so much. Um, so, hey, ladies, how are you? How are we doing? Good. Yeah. Listen, we are, we are um, in some very interesting times. And so I just want to start out by talking about how you've handled the pandemic. So as Black women, I think we have shouldered the burden of many things, um, both professionally and personally. So I'd just love to check in and see how you're doing with the pandemic. How has it impacted your leadership style? What lessons have you learned that have stayed with you? So Carol, you wanna go first? Sure. So sometimes it's easy to forget, but it's been a year already. These mm -hmm. things uh, get a little bit muddled in your head after a while and what seemed like a unsustainable situation continues to be sustained. So we're still in it. Um, uh, I'm in Johannesburg at the moment, so we haven't even started our vaccine rollout. So we're, we're quite behind in, in assuming that things are, are changing and we're going into what they're calling a third wave. So we're still deep in the pandemic. Uh, personally, it's been, in some ways, you know, I never thought I'd say it was a blessing, but in, in some ways, um, a, a few things happened in the last year that have been significantly different. Um, I have an eight-year-old who went into home Zooming because that couldn't be called any form of schooling as far as I was concerned. I was teacher, Zoom expert, homework, yeah. cook, everything. That's so right. this, this, <laughs> this was an interesting time because, um, you know, my view on education has always been that we, we tend to conflate education with school. And I, I felt that there was a lot more learning that happens at home than that happens at school. And the schools were really quick to try and switch these children, young children, into a format of learning that was completely, um, at that particular point, not relevant for what they were going through. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, kind of trying to get the school to just chill and let the kids be kids for a moment. So that took quite a lot. I had to change schools. Um, we went straight into uh, working from home. That wasn't hard, I think, because I've always been of the opinion that you can work from anywhere. I was traveling a lot, so that was great. I didn't see an airport for a year. So there were so many things that happened in such a short period of time, but it also gave us a chance to um, pivot the business. My business was 100% um, impacted because it was, we run a, a sponsorship and activation agency, marketing agency, mm -hmm. and it is purely dependent on personal face-to-face -face communication. So, you know, you wake up one day and you don't have a business and you got to try and figure out how to change things around. Um, we're, we're operating in several markets. Everybody went into lockdown. So it, it, it was an interesting period. It's been an interesting period for me personally. And um, I feel that I've built a, a, a side of me, but a new sort of set of muscles to be able to lead people at a time that's really challenging and give them hope that, you know, there's a purpose and a reason why we will continue to um, operate as a business, um, have an impact, 
um, give people hope and try and ensure that we we're building some sort of uh, resilience, but a resilience with a purpose, you know, not just to get out there and say we survive, but in the process of that survival, what else did we achieve? And so as a leader, tell me a little bit more about what are those muscles? What do you think is different about you as a leader? Um, I think empathy more, mm-hmm. um, a little more proximity to the business. I think that when you're leading a successful business, um, there's a different view that you have. Um, and when you're leading people that are going through challenging times, it requires a lot more personal involvement. And I think that's something that I had to bring to the table very quickly with the teams. Um, you know, the, the, the check-ins moved from, you know, profit and loss check-ins to, hey, you know, how are you doing? Yeah. How, how are the kids, you know, how's your family doing? And that, that's a switch, you know, and somewhere there, there's, there's a really fine balance between sort of carrying everybody along and trying to carry yourself along in that process. So that's been a good part of, I think, what I've been able to achieve in that period, just kind of a lot more awareness around what's happening with everyday people. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting as I hear you say that, and I've talked to so many Black women across the world. I think that's something that we bring that is unique which is a strong sense of empathy because we've oftentimes been the leaders in our community, the connection with people and how to develop our communities. Um, so I definitely resonate, that resonates with me. Uche, what's it been like for you? You're in Benin, how's that? So actually um, when COVID started, I was working in Monrovia. So I switched jobs during COVID, which, which is quite interesting. And, One um, name just change, right? We have changed schools, changed jobs. All right, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, but I think uh, Carol's absolutely right. I think uh, for me personally, there were two things that, that sort of changed for me uh, with COVID. One is just uh, being very aware that I, I needed to, I had this strong desire to, to be in touch with my family all the time, right? And so I've always been someone who called home often. Uh, but but with COVID and there was just so much, um, there was a lack of information initially and there was a lot of fear. And, you know, I was very worried about my parents and my brothers. And so, you know, we, we put together as many people did this sort of weekly Zoom meeting so that we could just touch base and see each other and talk to each other and check in and make sure people were fine. And it's something that we've continued till today. So I, I thought that was something that was really great that came out of it. On the professional side, we went into lockdown fairly early because we had a scare um, in, in our business in Monrovia regarding um, uh, COVID with one of our employees. Um, luckily, you know, uh, that employee was fine. But as Carol mentioned, this, this thing around empathy, I think because we had to very quickly move to uh, Zoom uh, team calls, you know, um, working from home. And because it was unexpected in our case, it, it happened like from Friday, and then by Saturday, everyone was working from home. Um, you know, that digital transformation that we had been talking about for so long and this idea of flexible working. And, you know, I was saying, are we sure we're ready for flexible working? All of a sudden had to happen immediately. Um, but also just being aware of people's situation. Like there was this heightened awareness of people's situations, right? You know, when I was coming up, I don't want to say how old I am, but when I was coming up, you know, when you were talking to your boss on the phone, there could be no noise in the background, you know, nothing happening, you locked your kids up somewhere so that they wouldn't disturb you. And all of those rules went out of the window, you know, because, you know, people have different circumstances at home and you had to understand that and respect that and be empathetic about that. So it just sort of made me, I think, more aware. I think there was a heightened awareness of people's home situation, which didn't necessarily come into play from a business perspective in the past um, that, you know, I think has carried on into, into coming to Cotonou. And switching jobs, you know, during, <laughs> during COVID was, was pretty tough as well. Um, luckily uh, here in Cotonou, you know, COVID has been really well managed and, you know, they've had a really good sort of process around making sure people are being tested and, and now vaccinated. But, you know, um, Imagine coming into a new company and not being able to meet your people in person. You know, um, one of the things that I, I really 
I think I'm really good at is, you know, I, I'm a good people leader. So I, I get a lot of pride and joy from engaging with my employees. And it's, it's hugely different to do that online than to be able to do that in person. And so even up until today, and I've been here eight months, there's still people I haven't met in person, you know, and that's, that has been quite challenging as well. But, you know, you have to be adaptable and you have to still find a way to drive the business and make sure that your employees are engaged and that they're safe. And did you, you went through the interview process totally remotely or did you actually- Everything was remote. <laughs> Everything was remotely, yeah. Um, I mean, you, so like, was a about it. you went through an entire process remotely. You actually decided to change jobs and you move countries. I mean, that's I a big can. deal. So <laughs> that's amazing. That's great. Um, Lucy, how are you? Hi, Susan. Um, hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can um, hear you fine. And, and apologies that I was a couple of minutes late, but you know how, 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 how it goes. We're, we're always on the move. It's yeah. from one Zoom to the next. So yeah, we're glad to see you all. Glad to see you too. So, you know, just share with us your perspective about how you've managed through COVID, any lessons learned from a leadership perspective. You work for a big global company. There's a lot of things changing. What's that been like? Okay, special shout out to Uche because I haven't seen her in a while. I can't believe she's been in her new job for eight months already. Uche, I need the lowdown on that. Nice to meet you, Carol, as well. Um, the, the advantage of big, so I'm currently speaking to you from the UK. The advantage of working in a big global company, I guess, is not just the size of the company, but it was the fact that as a company, we learned very quickly from our colleagues in Asia. So we were a bit ahead of the curve. And I actually started working from home about a week or so before the UK government even said it's time for people to work from home. Um, and, and I, you know, as I recount my experience, I, I recognize the fact that as black women, as black women on this panel who are very successful in our careers, I, I recognize the fact that regardless of what we experience, we're hugely pr privileged, you know, rel relative to many. So it's really about recognizing that and, and supporting supporting others. I got to work from home uh, really um, early um, and my kids are typically away from school, but by the time, for, uh, away in school, but by the time they were asked to leave their boarding school and come home, I had already had a few days to settle in. Um, the thing is that with the kids, it, uh, what I've learned through COVID is that the experience is so wide ranging. My kids are teenagers. And so nobody really needs me or wants me on their case in their schoolwork, right? Um, but I used to joke to people like, you know, just wait, someone's going to show up right now and say, what's for lunch? And, you know, you have that in your, in your face. But more, more importantly, there's the sort of the emotional aspect of having to live a life where you're, you're cooped in. And, and two of my kids are, are very much like me. They're extroverts. So can you imagine telling extroverts that you cannot go anywhere? It just kind of messes with you in a way. One of them, he was perfectly fine. It was like, you know, school heaven to be online and just plan his day. So there's a big element of providing additional support when this whole social fabric that the, the person is used to is gone. And while you're trying to do it for yourself, you have to do it for, for these uh, you know, children as well and support them through what is quite a difficult situation. How are you creating outlets for them to stay um, engaged? We were very fortunate that l last year, you know, some of the, the fortunate, but it was a traumatic experience. We were here and it was the day that the president of Ghana announced that the next day, it was Saturday night, and then he said, the next day, I'm closing the border. No one can come and go. So we spent a frantic night packing up, uh, me trying to convince um, these children that we've got to go now. Um, and we changed that book to change our flights because we had flights booked for later. And we changed and we, we, we um, tried to pack up. And at some point in that night, I just sat in the kitchen and just started crying because it just felt so overwhelming uh, and it made me think of people who have had to escape uh, you know from a place refugees and so on because that's how it felt like you know you're you're right it's all rushed and you're doing it now and I thought oh my goodness I'm rushing and who knows this pandemic should we even be sitting on a, a plane we didn't have masks we couldn't buy masks it was just so 
complicated and we we I still have the photo we went on the plane with you know improvised scarves because I asked my friends who are doctors what should I do um but look again I, I add the word privilege because all these things I'm saying this traumatic traumatic it's difficult but it's 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 it could be a lot worse as a firm uh, as I've just highlighted I ended up working in Ghana for five months because we were able to support everybody working remote remotely the, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll add um, is that look towards the end of last year both my husband and I were ill with COVID um, because we had we had got long story short we'd gone back to Ghana and just before we decided to come back uh, we we realized we were ill so we started the year I got my positive test results on the 1st of, of January 2021 um, and without going into the detail of the experience which is very difficult I just want to highlight that as leaders, one of the things we're going to have to be mindful of is COVID has actually traumatized our world. It's yeah. traumatized the people who've experienced it. It's traumatized the people who um, have watched their loved ones experience it in yeah. so on so many levels. And we don't know yet how people are going to come out of that trauma and how it's going to manifest. And so I remind people, look, I, again, I had a different day of crying when I was ill because I'd experienced someone dying. I'd experienced people thinking potentially my, my husband, it's a whole load of things. And I couldn't even speak. But my point is that as leaders, as black women, especially as black women, because a lot of perhaps minority, minorities around the world have had this a, a bit harder, especially in some, in some you know, Western countries. We need to be mindful of the trauma that's to come and we're going to have to be part of that healing process. And I guess Carol's point about empathy absolutely rings true. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting uh, to hear you talk about that because COVID for us in the United States obviously had several layers of trauma. Um, first of all, the people who were dying the most were Black Americans because of, you know, where we worked, um, where we lived, you know, all these issues of climate change, environmental racism, all these things. Uh, and, you know, there's like one degree of separation, so it might not have happened to you, but you certainly know somebody who it happened to. And then you layer on um, what have been, you know, long-standing foundational elements of the country that we live in, which is white supremacy and racism, and this event with George Floyd's murder happens. And it just ignited um, on top of all of the trauma that we we're feeling from COVID, this like fresh, what I would call Band-Aid ripping uh, and opening of a wound that was hard for so many of us. But I wonder, you know, you all have been in the diaspora, you're around the world. What was that like for you? Did it resonate uh, with you? I, you know, white supremacy and colonialism is certainly not something that is um, only specific to the United States. It exists in a lot of different places and it certainly plays in a lot of our companies and our careers. And so I just love anybody jump in about your perspective about how that played out and how it's manifested itself in the way you think about your business. I'll go. <laughs> um, no, I think, look, um, I was thinking about this uh, actually right before the call. And I think here for uh, specifically for MTN and uh, when you think about what happened with George Floyd, I think uh, thanks to social media, um, that was something that was, that was like something seen around the world, right? So, you know, there, there was just this sort of ground swelling globally um, around this, this injustice. And I think that between that and COVID, that it led to a lot of self-reflection for a lot of organizations around the world. Um, even within um, a company like MTN, you know, um, and I have to say, I was, I was really surprised, you know, that they, they put out some messaging around that when it happened. And also at the same time, I think, as I said, these two things happening at the same time, you know, the, the George Floyd murder and being within a pandemic at the same time really led to the organization saying to themselves, like, you know, what are we doing? You know, what kind of culture do we want to have in this, in this place? How are we treating our employees? How are we ensuring that we're supporting them? And it also, so it just then led to a much bigger conversation in terms of what are we do doing around diversity and inclusion? Are we doing enough? 
what is the value proposition for our employees? So it was like, you know, it's no longer about, you know, people who want to work for us, but how are we helping people who choose to work for us, right, going forward and, you know, helping them to achieve their, their dreams and desires. And I think for me personally, that was really great. Now, in my own organization, um, I think the thing for me was the reflection around diversity and inclusion um, and, and sort of saying like, how do we really understand, you know, some of the things that our employees are going through and how can we support that? How can we be more supportive? And we've used the word empathy quite a bit today, but I think that's absolutely right. Um, how can we be more supportive? How can we ensure that we are having, you know, very open and transparent conversations within our organization? I, you know, and I, I think that's been that's been good that we have shifted away from, you know, being an organization that perhaps was not focused on those kind of issues in the past or didn't necessarily speak up on those kind of issues in the past and say, actually, it's okay to do that. Our employees want to see that we care about those kind of things and that they know that it's okay for them to have those conversations with us. So I, mean, I think that that was what I got out of it. I mean, it was, <sighs> I have to say that, um, the George Floyd thing, actually, it, the anniversary is just recent, right? So it, it, it happened around my birthday. Um, I'm not gonna say how old I was turning, but I was planning to have you know, a celebration and I actually canceled it. It felt so inappropriate for me to be celebrating during that time. Personally, that's how I felt. And you know, it just, it still, it still sticks, sticks with me. And I think um, it's just made me a lot more conscious, I think, as a leader as well. Um, to say in the past, perhaps we weren't always willing to talk or speak out on social issues, um, but this definitely has forced us to say that we cannot as organizations and corporations and CEOs be silent when these sort of things are happening. Yeah. Carol, how about you? What was your experience like around this? So um, professionally, I run a small business um, and I think in some ways, because we, it's a small business, um, we're fortunate in our ability to be able to um, make definite intentional uh, choices. And, you know, we, 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 we try and ensure that the intent that we have mm -hmm. Um, has to be shown in what we do every day. So how do you close the gap between intent, um, looking at ensuring that women um, and everybody in the workplace has the same, um, uh, the same opportunities, um, irrespective of, of, of where they're from or who they are? And how do we practice that with intent? And I think a small organization is able to do that in a much more uh, meaningful way because th there's very clear steps that we take through the process of whether we're recruiting people or whether we're managing people through a process or, or whether we're giving feedback. It's very intentional. And the values of the organization have always really been about uh, people and, and, and our business is, is a lot of people say our business is a people pe people business. Our business really is a people business. Like that's your asset, your number one asset. So we're very intentional about it. So in some ways, uh, if I'm being truly honest, there's, I, I think for me, um, societal inequalities have always existed, always from time immemorial. And I, I also think that in some ways, you know, there was a lot of things clashing at the same time that made the spotlight mm. on something that has existed for a very long time. Um, all of a sudden we got this huge big focus around it, but there were many incidences like that for a very long time that haven't had the same level of exposure and interest and conversation and talking about it. So it hasn't changed necessarily things and in the space of looking at it, we're kind of like, you know, the whole Black Lives Matters, it has always mattered. You know, all lives matter. To us, and it's always mattered. I'm not sure it's always mattered to others. I, I, think, I think all lives matter, you know. And yes, there's always going to be other people that are happy with a status quo that suits them. 
because it gives them a level of power within that position. And we have to accept that. And the consequences of the things that we do and say and, and the stand that we take about things like these have to accept that there is not, not everybody's gonna be happy about it and not everybody wants the change. So yeah. our responsibility and the way I saw it was, you know, what's my personal responsibility? You know, what biases am I holding that perpetuate this, whether it is against another human being as a woman or as a race or as a class or what biases am I holding that are just in some ways the triggers for things like these to happen. So yeah. that, that for me was the takeaway, you know, during that period, just all these things clashing at the same time. And then I must hold myself accountable in some of the things that I do. I say the choices that I make um, in whatever small way that I can and in the organization that I run to make sure that everybody understands the values that we must continue to stand for. So um, in the um, spirit of just shouting out appropriateness, as we all understand that your business isn't that small. Yes, and Curry put in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> small is relative is. small is very relative but we want to shout you out yeah it back covid back. was a levelizer i'm a startup now you know everything started from zero <laughs> i'm a startup yeah yeah no I had to call that out lucy what's it been like for you um you know obviously i've, I've seen some of the things that have come out of morgan stanley and i obviously know a lot of black employees at morgan stanley <laughs> What's that like for you? So, so you're putting me on notice. Susan's like, you see, you can't lie to me because I know exactly the data's there. <laughs> that was hilarious, Susan. Look, um, the first thing is, it was uh, an extremely um, shocking, traumatizing experience. What it did for me personally is I took on a new role. So I've taken on an additional role leading um, DNI across technology operations and firm resilience, which isn't only US focused, but uh, focused uh, across our footprint. Um, but let me let me get a little bit specific here because I can give you the spiel of this is what the company has done. We set up an institute for inclusion. We put a lot of money behind it. But you'd expect that for, from a large US firm that we have to not only, uh, you know, be express our shock, but invest in the in at least kicking off the process, which was last year. But we've done a, a, many things um, since since then. Look, I I grew up as somebody who has visited the U.S. a few times. I have a, a number of relatives who are American, and I have some friends who are American. Uche, Robin, a few a few people. But in 2016, with everything that was going on, and we won't go into what was going on in the US in 2016, wink, wink, um, <laughs> I actually decided to be more intentional in building my understanding of the context of what goes on um, um, in the US, particularly the Black experience. Because I was having these engagements with my friends and relatives, and I realized that I didn't fully appreciate and understand contextually what, what, what the, the, the story was and, and the history was. And I was really struck one time when I was speaking at Columbia University and I, you know, everyone who spoke, who stood up to speak, who was African-American 2016 would start off, introduce themselves, but also talk about their journey and talk about how proud they were that, you know, their ancestors were on a plantation and now they're here in a business school. So that really gave me context. And so I, you know, went to the African American Museum of History and so mm -hmm. on and read as much as I, I, I could. Um, the bottom line is that there are fundamental systemic issues that have persisted for a very long time that were exacerbated and deeper, mm -hmm. put further in everybody's face. And like I said, I, I went out of my way to study it, but if you haven't studied it, then COVID put it in your face. Um, and, and George Floyd, unfortunately, you know, the way, you know, it's hard to talk about George Floyd and not have to force myself not to picture what I watch. You can't unsee it. And it, it, it hits you, you're right there in, in your, your stomach. You cannot treat another human being like that mm -hmm. unless you, you fundamentally believe that their life is worthless. You have to have a belief that drives you mm -hmm. to do what he did. It, it, it is, is what, what I, because there's no other justification. Um, so the bottom line is that 
it's not only, to, to my mind, it's not just a question of historical um, inequity, it's systemic inequity that persists. And the problem with it, if, if, if things are systemic is that if you're not intentional about changing and fixing and addressing them, they don't go away at all. It, it, it won't fix itself. Right. These things don't fix themselves. Now, I want to pivot a little bit, um, Susan, to the context of, of Africa, especially as we're talking about African soft, soft power. There is definitely an element um, on the continent of us being more plugged in and learn uh, and, and learning more about the Black experience globally. Because what I try to explain to people is that what you see happen to the U in the U.S., to black people on that, call it micro scale because it's one country, actually plays out on a macro scale across the world. The disadvantage and inequity for black people, even black countries, is global, right? For instance, you take Brazil, for instance, and most people don't realize that Brazil is a majority black country. It's actually majority black than majority white, mm -hmm. to the extent that it's the second most populous black, black country. You know, my good friends in Nigeria, you know, carry the, the number one spot. And as I tell people, you don't have a Nigerian friend, go find one because you don't, you don't have enough friends. Um, but the point is that we forget and what has played out in Brazil and to what extent, extent has race been part of the response? if we draw, draw from that. So I think in Africa, yes, it's the landmass that aggregates the, the most black people, but we have a responsibility. If we can change the way Africa is perceived and the way the African is perceived, it will influence positively the way the black person is perceived on, on the planet. It will change the way the black person is, is, is engaged. So I say to people, look, if, if an African feels what happens in another, especially in the Western world to a black person has nothing to do with them, they're wrong. It has everything to do with them. When your head of state is going to negotiate, when your chief biologist is going to negotiate, when you're, the perception and the mindset with which the black person in the persons in the person they're speaking to his home country is, is, is um, treated is exactly the mindset that is is coming to the table to negotiate with your head of state. So if someone thinks that George Floyd's did, life didn't matter enough to keep their knee on his le neck for so long, I can assure you that that same person, people who think like him, they think the same of all of us. And so we have a real work to do. You know, and it, so it permeates itself in so many different ways. I, you know, just a small story. So my, my um, father-in-law, Bought my daughter this little talking globe thing uh and so um you it has like a stylus and you can like it's made by leapfrog and you can like press the different countries and it plays this like really happy music behind it so my husband and i decided to pick all of the places around the world that have like conflict uh and like where there's all these issues and play and it's like oh the people of benin you know it's just like all oh, happy music but doesn't talk about any of like the the strife or issues that have happened in the past you all around Brazil, same thing. Oh, Brazil is this wonderful country. And then like I was explaining to my daughter that actually the way the globe is made is actually incorrect because so many of, it makes all the like Western countries look like they're so much bigger than they really are because they all could fit from a landmass perspective in the continent of Africa, boom. And she was like, wow, mommy, why is that? And she's five. And so, you know, we're very straight with her. And I was like, listen, that's what you're what you're witnessing is this reinforcement of belief and in, in a power system that makes us less than. And so these are all opportunities for us to make sure that we're educating because you know when you you talked about um, people in Africa and outside of the US being more aware of what's happening in the US, I, I, I know for a fact that most black Americans are not really aware of what's happening. Um, across the diaspora and in other places. And that has to be something that we address and we change. And, and that's on purpose. I mean, I was um, looking at um, the news today and they were talking about Nicole Hannah-Jones. I don't know if you guys know who she is, but she's a, uh, just very accomplished um, journalist, writer. She got asked to take on this fellowship um, at in tenured professor, this fellowship, a professorship at University of North Carolina, which is where she went to college. And because of conservative voices that don't like the 1619 Project, 
she's now being denied tenure, which is what the seat has always come with. And so, you know, this came out of the news this morning and my first reaction was like, we, we can't let that happen. Like we got to organize like globally and we have to like make sure that we speak up on her behalf. Um, but you know, all of this stuff comes with a, a price, right? Um, uh, you know, Malcolm X had a saying that the most disrespected woman in the world is the black woman. The most devalued woman in the world is the black woman. Uh, but yet Maya Angelou said, and still we rise. And we still figure out how to rise um, despite all of these challenges, but they come with a cost. And so I'm looking here at the picture of the four of us and we all have our hair in some natural way right? We all have like, you know, our, we, we all have embraced our features, if you will, like we glow in and, you know, we look on all shiny and beautiful, but the world doesn't see us that way. And so every day we are faced with, um, you know, images and a world that says that we shouldn't be sitting at the table. So I'd love for you all to talk about what do you do to get yourself ready to show up at the table because there's so many young people out there who think that when they see you, um, you know, they're like, oh my God, she's so accomplished. You know, Lucy's amazing. You know, she, she just, it's just easy for her. Uche, oh, she just, you know, seamlessly packed up and moved from one country to another and she's the CEO of this. It doesn't come easy, right? And so I'd really love for you all to talk about what are the things that you do to prepare yourself to be able to show up at the table and what kind of self-care regimen do you put yourself through to make sure that you stay sane through this process? Uche, I can see you're like itching the, like, go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, I don't know if I'm itching, but I, I, think, I just wanted to say one thing before I get into the answer of that question. You know, um, one of the things as I, as I get older that I, I'm beginning to resent a bit is this view or this sort of perception of the strong black woman and this thing around resilience. I, I, I'm beginning to really think that it's, it's toxic to some degree. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I'm thinking just, uh, and I'm thinking just about uh, some of the work I've done over the last 10 years and some of the roles that I've been in over the last 10 years. And I would say the mental sacrifices um, that I've had to, to make to be successful. And that's not to dissuade anyone. Um, but just in terms of how we're defining successful black women um, and what that takes to be successful in our jobs. And I, I'm sure Lucy can speak to this as well. You know, um, this is my third CEO job. I, I don't even want to get into some of the stories, but I think um, at the end of one of my CEO uh, terms, I, I actually felt I needed therapy. It had just been such a, a difficult and, and, and toxic work environment. And there is very little room for vulnerability, right? Because you, you kind of feel as though you can't show weakness. You have to be resilient because that's what you're known to do. You're, you're known to always pick yourself up and just get on with things. Um, you know, you, you have to be strong for your employees as well because you can't be seen as a woman to be crying in the office, you know? And even though you may have situations within your organization or externally or whatever, you're not free to go and have a conversation with your, with your group or your company because then it's a question as to, well, are you ready for this job? So, you know, I, I think, you know, I just wanted to sort of make that point, you know, um, that, you know, resilience and, and strength. The chat is blowing up because people are in violent agreement with you. And I think that <laughs> because, you know, it's something that we all, um, and, and I think sometimes within our own community, our community says, well, we'll just give it to the sisters. They'll take care of it. Um, and that's not okay. But I'm sorry, keep going. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, we, we just, I think, look, you know, in 2021, we, we just need to be mindful about these words, you know, um, for Black women. We, we're normal. We bleed like everyone else. We, we want to be soft and vulnerable, um, you know, as well. So in terms of what do I do um, to manage and I, I really, it may sound like a very small thing, but I think it's really important, especially for women who are looking to be leaders. 
there is something around, you know, having your tribe. I, and this is really important. I, and I remember having this conversation with Lucy uh, maybe a couple of years ago. Um, no one tells you when you're pushing for the CEO job and you do push for it, uh, that's, you know, how lonely it is. And the fact that, you know, there is absolutely no one to talk to, it's just you. You don't necessarily feel safe about t talking to people about issues or problems um, and how to go about solving them because, again, you don't want to show the vulnerability. Um, so just having this sort of small group of women, for me, um, has been incredibly helpful. When I was working in Liberia and, and you know, I had some issues there, that tribe kept me standing. You know, there were days I didn't want to go to work, for instance, because things were so difficult. And that tribe kept me standing. You know, they'd come to my house, pull me out of bed, go to work. What do you need to talk about? Shall we have a, a glass of wine tonight? Let's talk this through. Um, same thing here um, in Benin, you know, I, you know, I have a tribe as well. So apart from, and, and again, I'm sure uh, the women on the panel will, will also talk about the more technical aspects of what's required <laughs> to, to, you know, uh, be successful. But I, I, I really encourage women to sort of put together that tribe to say, you know, these are, these are my road dogs. When I'm down, when I'm having issues, this is a safe space for me to have a conversation so that I can get up and do this job every day because it requires that level of intensity and commitment from me. And that can be pretty harrowing sometimes. Yes. Um, and can you, I mean, I know you said you didn't uh, want to tell, like, the give the tea or the dirt. <laughs> but I do think it's important for um, the women, especially the younger women, to hear, like, what has happened to you? I mean, I know in my own career, um, I've been devalued. Um, I have been spoken to in all kinds of crazy ways. Um, I've had the... Uh, um, and, and from other white women, like the, you know, the aggressions, I won't call them microaggressions, but, um, and then they, um, then they played the victim and then I was the, the bad person. So like, there's a lot of things that have happened, but I think we have to share uh, with our, with our sisters, like what has happened to us so that they can recognize that they are not alone. Yeah. Uh, and and know when it's time to go get therapy. So please just share. I mean, you don't have to share a lot, but I'd love for you to just share some of the things that have happened. No, that's fine. I mean, I think uh, I did a podcast around this, so it's 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 public uh, knowledge. But um, certainly, in one of my CEO jobs, I had an, uh, a situation where someone tried to assault me in my office, and you know, now think about this. You know, as a woman, you are certainly I am a champion of women in every organization I've been in. You know, um, I've had conversations around sexual harassment in my organization, uh, very transparent, open conversations around that. And here I was as a CEO. So first I'm a CEO, I'm having a meeting with someone and, you know, this person decides to try to assault me in my office. And it's like, how is this happening to me? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I am a champion of women. I am someone who has had these conversations within my organization. And, but what was very interesting, I mean, it happened. I was, I was obviously very upset uh, when this happened, but I think, and this is uh, something that was very interesting. I spoke about this in the podcast. My first thoughts was, I can't say this to anybody because, you know, they're going to suddenly think that I can't cope with these kinds of situations. And so therefore, you know, there's, there's that silence that you sort of have, to, you feel that you impose upon yourself, right? Um, as opposed to trying to do something about it. And this was one of the situations um, where, you know, my tribe was really helpful because I, I left from my office that day and just went and sat with those women and just, you know, obviously broke down. Um, and the next day, you know, these guys, these uh, ladies, sort of help me sort of get along, which is again, what we do, we're resilient, we sort of get along, right? And just move on. So I, I think that's one example. And there was se there's several other examples. I think, Susan, you've mentioned that, like even just being a female CEO, um, for instance, within MTN, uh, I'm one of two women uh, running 20, you know, within the 21 countries that we have, you know, um, that in itself is, is an interesting dynamic you know, when you are the only woman in the room as well. So again, like I said, um, 
I don't want to use the word resilience because I think it's important for us to understand that we don't always have to be resilient, but I think in, in not being resilient, you have to have a safe space not to be resilient. That's why I was talking about the tribe earlier. Yeah. Um, Carol, you want to share? Yeah, it's been, you know, before I, I owned the business, um, uh, it was owned by a pretty big investment group. And um, I came to South Africa in 2008. I was young and fighty and ready to conquer the world. And, you know, I, I suppose in many ways, uh, quite inexperienced in, in what to expect in situations like those. And I, I, I walked into... Uh, my first board meeting and there was 11 white male board members and you know I, 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 I think over the years you know it was quite obvious that they also had to get over having to deal with the situation of a black woman presenting to them at a board meeting and even to just the basic greeting you know is do you shake their hands, do you uh, just say hello, you know, um, I had a fantastic chairman, you know, and he, he was perhaps in the three or four years that he was my chairman, the only person who hugged me in this meeting. Um, and, and, and situations like those kind of disarm you first because you're not quite certain what the take out of the meeting will be and whether the meeting is focused on what you're saying, how you look, how you dress, and you know how you show up and it was almost it's pretty stressful when you're thinking you know I'm going to a board meeting and now I've got to try and look at my wardrobe to think what is appropriate um, what will not be taken out of context you know uh, and so taking the focus away from yourself which in itself is 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 a problem because you're taking the focus away from yourself and your ability and your competency and now you're dealing with all these other external things so that, that, that was a difficult situation that I, I, I can say that for a woman that, that is working in an in a environment where you're, you're constantly trying to, um, there, there's so many layers of things that you have to think about that have got nothing to do with the ability and what you bring to the table. And you get judged on so many different things that you don't even know about. And you're constantly having to fight through this you know, just trying to get things across becomes three times more difficult because it is you and not because it is um, a good suggestion or a good idea or a good business initiative. So I, I, I think coming out of that and, and actually, you know, buying the business and bringing into it this uh, kind of freshness that allows people because of their experience to just you know come in with whatever it is that you have on the table and, and recognizing people for their efforts is a really big deal for me right now mm -hmm. um, but also intentionally um, accepting that our processes and our, our uh, selection of, of who comes into the business is already consciously biased against the woman. So we're conscious about if a woman comes to an interview process, um, I'm gonna give her a little more slap, to be honest, um, than a male counterpart, because I know that it, there's just three or four more steps that she's gotta go through, just through a process. Um, but I, I think in many ways, I, I find that, you know, living and working in, uh, South Africa in those early days made me a lot more conscious about um, the inequalities that women face and especially black women more than I had experienced before working in Kenya or Nigeria or Ghana. You know, South Africa just kind of put it in my face um, and, and made it a lot more visible and, you know, made me have to think a little bit more about some of my uh, views and perspectives and choices that I was making from a career perspective. Um, and many times I just wanted to quit, like, you know, this is just not worth the effort or the time or that I, I could probably do other things that were appreciated. Um, but I, 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 I suspect that in many ways, 
having to face those challenges as well um, builds your ability to be able to influence another decision somewhere else down the line. And I think that's probably why I'd say I, I stayed. I, I think that's probably why I bought the business. It was just, maybe it wasn't a really good idea at that time, but it was just to prove that I can do it. <laughs> Come COVID, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about this decision, <laughs> but <laughs> here we are. And, and, and for me, this advantage is exactly that, is that if you've had to go through certain experiences, how do you use those experiences to build and how do you impact more people through those experiences? And, and I think that's where that advantage comes from. Yes, we'll see. Yeah, Susan, I want to touch on two things. Well, I, you know, one is bullying and the other is um, sisterhood. I once worked for a gentleman um, um, in Ghana and the fact that he was deeply racist was, I think, was obvious, like pretty obvious, but he extended it into what I effectively saw as bullying because he came across as being on a, on a mission, even though we were in Ghana, to really prove that the African isn't capable of holding a, an executive position in this industry, let alone a woman, yeah. right? And he was very overt about that. And, and I know you like to hear specifics. Um, so, so, so the general, you know, the African can't do this job was how he would literally spell out everybody's job for them and, you know, tell them, Susan, you need to do this. And he would literally write it out for you. And you need to do, after you've done this, do this. And he said, we're a bunch of educated people. We're recruited for a reason. But where the bullying really came into it for me was that, look, I... At the time, I was a mom. I had very, I'm um, still a mom. I had very young children. Um, and he asked me to take on a role, which he would not ask any of the non black white men who worked in our organization to do. Not one single one of them were asked to go and be stationed away from, from home every single day of the week. And for him to actually go on and then say to me, I, he, I don't want to see you in this office because I was trying to negotiate and say, look, this is unreasonable for me to be gone five days a week, every single week is just not sustainable. And, you know, he was, he was, I, I never want to see you in this office. And look, some people left, some people just called it a day and just walked away for, for, them, for the company. Cause you can imagine if this, this was my experience, there were other people having different versions of this same, same experience. Um, so Look, I, I, I stuck it out. My, my, I had great support from my family um, with, with the kids, but it was tough. It was tough to have to be away from home every single day of the, week, of the working week as a routine and not even be I, I experience it as something you've negotiated and you've agreed in, but someone actually telling you to your face, um, I, I don't want to see you here. And it's his fundamental issue. And he said these things as well. So when I say bullying, it's not just to go and do the work. It's the things the person adds to it. You know, you people think this, this, this is easy to do this job, so on and so forth. Um, excuse me, but I, you know, without you know, blowing my own home, I am far more educated than you are. Um, I, you know, there's so many reasons to trust that I have the capability to do this job and to ask me to, bully me um, this way is, is, is actually wrong. Now, look, I ended up having to encounter this person for a number of years, even when I wasn't there, um, working directly for him. And then finally, one day after we weren't working in the same com company, the bullying continued in the form of if he saw something that a senior executive had failed, and I remember this particular one was an aud a telecom audit issue in Kenya, and he sent it to me on WhatsApp. And that was the day I blocked him. I was like, you know what? I don't need you in my life. Um, you're not bringing anything <laughs> useful to me. Your, your only goal in life is to prove how I shouldn't be me. Right. Look, I could tell if I give you the list of things he did from a bully, bullying point of view, you'll be astounded at my level of tolerance. But in the end, I just zip. We're done. I don't actually have to speak to you. And that's a good thing. So 
you know, there, there are seven point, I know, six billion other people um, out there. Uh, so bullying is very real and, and sometimes it takes the form of, you know, um, you know, as Uche described sexual assault or the, the uh, or as Carol described the, the belief that we're, we're less capable then and, and it's so important that we recognize it, that we don't get locked, lost in this whole, I've got to be tough, I've got to be resilient, as, as Uche said, so even if the person, the behavior is wrong, I put up with it because I have to. So, so let's be upfront and let's support each other. And that's where I come into the point of, of, of sisterhood. Um, like I had the opportunity, quite frankly, the privilege of working with Uche for a number of years, uh, many years ago. And I want to share this because part of the reason why we have conversations like this is to reinforce the notion that uh, we can support each other and work with each other. Um, and every time someone says to me that women are their own best enemies, I, I immediately correct them. I disagree because when you put any group of human beings together, there will be disagreements. When two white men agree or disagree or even literally tear each other down, no one turns around and says, oh, they're their the own worst enemy. No, that's just normal. So when it happens with us, it's like the worst thing, thing ever. And I, I, I mentioned Uche because in working together, of course we had disagreements. And of course we had times that we, we agreed with each other and got along. But I tell you two things. My, my husband always um, does, uh, Uche doesn't know this, but my husband does an, an, an Uche test. Like if, any, if I come home any day and I complain about somebody, he'll be like, you and it's like you and Uche, you'll be fine, you'll be friends after this. And I'm not even gonna listen to this, you know, because it's very, very normal. So, num number one is the fact that you have to be able to respect the fact that even when you have a disagreement with somebody, the person brings a lot of value, and the person is in, in, in the end, a lot of the time, actually your supporter, um, as well. But the other thing I highlight is that don't allow that sense of whatever is different around you to rob you of the opportunity to learn because I, I know now I'm embarrassing um, Uchi a little bit but there are also things I've gone on to do that I recognize myself that oh my goodness I learned that from working with Uche I saw Uche do x y and z and I've added it to my toolkit so the sisterhood matters from the point of of supporting each other but it also matters from the point of view of respecting that other people have skills, capabilities, experiences that you don't have, and you should take advantage of the opportunity to learn. Because if you're going to try and learn all the lessons yourself, then good luck. You're going to be here a long time. Okay. You can take that shortcut, learn and run with it. And who better to learn from than a sister? You know, and um, on that, because we are at time, we're going to leave it at that. Who better to learn from than a sister? We've heard about having tribes, about making decisions that we can actually do better than the situation and just take the bull by the horns. We've heard about, I, I saw so much in the chat about like cutting people off. I think that is just great advice, especially when somebody is trying to steal your joy and like is not accretive to your life, just let them go and keep it moving and the value of the sisterhood. So I can't say thank you enough. Uche, thank you so much for joining us. Carol, thank you so much for joining us. Lucy, thank you so much for joining us. And Kura, I'm gonna turn it back to you, but this has been a phenomenal conversation. I feel like this is like part one and we need to go to part two. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, guys, that's exactly how I feel as well. I, I literally was having goosebumps when you guys were speaking, like literally, I, I mean, Carol, I know a lot of the things you didn't say on this, um, you know, chat, like there's a lot that you didn't say in terms of your, your rise. Uche, phenomenal. Lucy, amazing. And Susan, I don't know if I, this has been like, this is family talking. It feels really like living room things that we can get into part two part three part four there's just so much to talk about but it's just like who better to learn from than you know these sisters here like i'm so humbled to be in this room with you guys i'm and I just hooked some shit up sorry excuse my friends oops um well, thank you so much, guys. This has been amazing. And we have to go to part two on this. Um, Obi, you want to say something? Because I know you're like, oh, who are these women? <laughs> no, 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 no. I know who these women are. I mean, the women, the women nailed it. I just want to say, it's just been a privilege to be in the room. Um, 
Lucia is my sister, so I know all about her. Carol, it's great to hear your story. And Lucy is like a sniper. I'm never going to be on the wrong side of her. Um, Susan, thank you so much for everything you did. I thought it was a wonderful conversation. And, you know, yeah, man, I've got the sisters by my side. I think that's the most important <laughs> thing. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lucy, thank you as well. I'm calling you right afterwards. Thank you, sure. thank you, thank so, you much. all. Thank you so much, guys. I, I, I really am going to say this. I say this all the time. So this has been the best. This, this has been the best panel. I had this. I love how the tech is bad, but like the best panel. <laughs> thank you, baby. Take care, Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye bye, ladies. Carol, Have a good day. speak soon. Everybody speak soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>